Welcome, everybody, to the Weekly Space Hangout. My name is Fraser Kane, and I am the publisher of Universe Today, and I have gathered together um, a collection of my favorite space journalists and scientists to discuss uh, what's going on this week in space and astronomy news. So uh, let's introduce everybody who we've got here. I'm going to just sort of pass through them in order. No no order. We've got Amy Shuretitle from Vintage Space. Hey, Amy. Hi. We've got Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society. There she is. We've got Nicole Gallucci, a.k.a. the Noisy Astronomer. Dr. Nicole Gallucci. Yay. And we've got Scott Lewis, a.k.a. Hi, the Bald Astronomer. Know the Cosmos, my wonderful co-host on, uh, on the Virtual Star Parties. Hey, Scott. So this week we've got a bunch of stories. We're going to get a wonderful update from, uh, from Emily about Curiosity and Opportunities uh, anniversary. So this is great. Um, we're going to get some information about a, a historic gamma ray burst that uh, blasted some trees. Uh, we're going to talk about the Manatee Nebula. Uh, we're going to talk about a new thesaurus for astronomers. Uh, a really cool photograph of Betelgeuse, uh, the star, not the ghost. And, uh, and if we have time, we're going to talk about how dung beetles use the Milky Way to uh, orient themselves. So, so this is great. Uh, Emily Lakdawalla, you can hit the ground running and tell us everything about, uh, about Curiosity at night. Uh, curiosity can actually work at night, which um, is it's, uh, it's much harder to do than you might think because uh, Mars gets quite cold at night. The temperature can swing by like 80 degrees Celsius. So um, it's, it's not all that easy for spacecraft to work at night, but it's nuke powered, so it's, it's warm and ready to go and can sometimes be operated at night. It has a couple of instruments that take environmental data, and so they're designed to work around the clock, but there's a particular instrument that they've got a couple of tricky ways of operating at night. That instrument is called MALI. That's M-A-H-L-I. It stands for Mars Hand Lens Imager. And it really is intended to be like a geologist hand lens. And because I am a real geologist, I have my own hand lens, so I can show you what a geologist ordinarily does with one of these things. They take, they pick, they pick up a rock. Of course, I'm a bad geologist who didn't have a rock in my office at this point. Um, you pick up a rock, you look at it with your hand lens up super close, and you might tilt it this way and that way, trying to find little glints off of um, off of crystals in the rock. It helps you identify what minerals are present and everything. And so this hand lens imager, they do the same thing. The problem is that they can't pick up a rock that's in front of them and tilt it this way and that way in order to see the glints. What they can do is look at the rock at night and the camera, um, let me show you a picture of what the camera actually looks like. I'll share my screen. Doody do. Okay, so here's what the camera looks like. And uh, this is the, the, the dust cover is on the camera right now. And around the edge, you can see these little holes in the dust cover. There is a couple of sets of LED lights. And th there's two pairs in particular, one on this side, one pair on this side. And if they use Molly at night, they can turn on those LEDs to illuminate the landscape from two different angles. So the light is coming from two different angles um, uh, in the field of view. The image that's, um, that... Uh, uh, oh yeah, that Nicole is showing right now. Sorry, Nicole. I tried to figure out a process of elimination here. That was image no that, face, no face, no face. <laughs> image Im the image that Nicole is showing right now is one of those two um, pictures. So you can see there's strong shadows. It's actually been illuminated by the the bright white LEDs on the um, end of Molly. So this is nighttime imaging. They looked at it back and forth with the two different illumination directions. They used that to try to figure out what's going on. But then they did something even trickier. They looked at this thing with the other set of LEDs that they have, and the other set of LEDs are long wave ultraviolet. So they had, they're at a wavelength of about 350 nanometers, which is just on the ultraviolet end of the spectrum. And that's basically black light. And so what that does is it um, lights up the landscape, and there are certain minerals that fluoresce under black light, so they, they shine a color under black light. And so here is the image that was taken under this black light. Now. When I saw this, I was like, holy glowing rocks, Batman, that's really awesome. Um, as it turns out, it may not actually be fluorescing. What we're looking at is a mineral that's white, um, it's gypsum, uh, most likely. And um, it, that mineral, because it's white, it's going to be brighter at any wavelength. We're illuminating it with, a, with an LED that's mostly in the ultraviolet, but also leaks a little bit into violet and blue wavelengths. So it doesn't really look any color other than blue, so it may not actually be fluorescing. 
if it were fluorescing, it would look more like this. And again, I'm going to share my screen. Um, here is the Molly calibration target, and it's got all these chips of material. Watch this cream colored one in the middle. This one fluoresces under, under ultraviolet light. And when I switch to ultraviolet light illumination conditions, that's what it does. So if this rock that we were looking at under ultraviolet light had turned yellow or red or orange or green, we, would, we could be certain that we were seeing a fluorescing mineral. Since it's only blue, um, it's not totally obvious that we are actually seeing a fluorescing mineral. It's still super cool that they took a black light to Mars and are taking pictures at night under black light. I think that's pretty awesome. Um, it's pretty it, trippy. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's, it's a really neat little tool. Molly is awesome. Um, I'm, I'm working on a blog entry right now on some of the other things that they can do with this. The principal investigator on Molly is a scientist named Ken Edgett, who is just a teddy bear. He's one of the nicest scientists I know, and he's really good at explaining what he does. His academic paper describing Molly is incredibly readable. I think that most anybody watching the show would be able to get a lot out of um, that academic article, and there's not many academic articles you can say that about. So, um, so anyway, is, this is, is super cool. I want to see more of it. Is it on archive? Uh, no, it's a it's a space science reviews article, but it's open okay. access. All of oh, the okay. space science reviews articles on uh, MSL's instruments are open access, so cool. anybody can read them. So, I mean, is this something that they're going to do regularly, or was this? you know, like a one-time thing. I mean, as you said, it's, it's, it's nuclear powered, but still it needs to use all that energy to run its heaters at night. And so, you know, how often is, are they going to be doing this kind of night science? I suspect that uh, if they pick a rock that they think is important enough to be worth um, doing like an APXS, which is the alpha particle X-ray spectrometer analysis on, if they think it's that cool, I don't see why they wouldn't do the Molly nighttime imaging as well. Um, one of the other things that I read in that Molly um, paper is that uh, the instrument works pretty fast, so if you've got the instrument close to a rock, you might as well take every possible image you can take with it, um, even if you don't plan on returning them all to Earth. They always return all the thumbnails to Earth. They don't always ret return the full-size ones. But if you've gone through the trouble of positioning the arm exactly on a rock, take a boatload of pictures and then see what you want to do with them later. That's amazing. So the other piece of big news is that Opportunities hit uh, its ninth anniversary uh, Yeah, which this is week. Just amazing. And the coolest thing, I think, actually, about what Opportunity is doing right now is that if you look at the images that Opportunity is sending back, they don't look a whole lot different from the images that Curiosity is sending back. Now, it's got older cameras, so, you know, the cameras are on um, Curiosity are a bit spiffier, but they're both looking at rocks shot through with veins with little concretions inside them. It's really amazing. They're on opposite sides of Mars, and yet they're looking at the same kind of rocks. So we, I mean, we the significant thing about having a sedimentary rock shot through with veins and having concretions inside it is that that's at least two, maybe even three different episodes of that material being wet over Mars's history. So we've got a lot of repeated water activity over a long period of time going on here, which is pretty cool. I wonder if techniques being discovered on one side of the planet are going to help with some of the work they're doing on the other side of the planet. You could have these situations where, you know, Curiosity is going to turn up some kind of structure or feature in the rocks, and they're going to turn around and say, let's take a look at that with opportunity and see if we can see the same thing or, or vice versa. It's, they're certainly feeding into each other, and um, a lot of what Opportunity and Spirit did with their microscopic imagers really informed the development of the MOLLE instrument on Curiosity, and it's going to make um, MOLLE a much more effective tool than the microscopic imager was, and even the microscopic imager revolutionized what we knew about Mars. I didn't know until I read the Molly paper, I'd for, or at least I'd forgotten, that there was an active debate about whether there was wind-blown sand-sized particles on Mars at all before the microscopic imager settled that debate for once and for all, almost as soon as they put the um, camera on the rock in the first place nine years ago. So that's pretty amazing. So, I mean, nine years though, it's, you know, we've already lost spirit. How is, how's Opportunity doing? How much longer do you think we're going to go? Opportunity's doing great. Um, it's got uh, one bulky um, steering actuator and one wheel. So one of the, the right front wheel can't rotate back and forth, but it can spin. So it's not, um, it's not lame like spirit was. And um, its instruments are um, not doing so great. So it's got um, the mini test, which was the, the way they could remotely sense chemical, uh, mineral composition. Um, that has been dead since the great dust storm of 2007. 
the um, uh, Mossbauer spectrometer, which is the way they could figure out what iron-bearing minerals are present in rocks, that thing uh, depended on a radioactive source of cobalt that's been through like 10 half-lives, so it basically doesn't work anymore. So the only really way that they can get at mineral composition is with the color camera, actually. And as you can imagine, that's not particularly precise. So it's gotten a lot harder to do the kind of science that they need to do with Opportunity, but the rover's still roving, it can still take pictures, can still drive drive from one place to another. The APXS still works. Um, so as long as it's got a camera and the APXS going, it's still a good scientific mission to keep going. If it loses something like the APXS or the PanCam, then I think we'd have, uh, NASA would have to have a discussion about um, if it was really returning science anymore. So do you think we'll hit 10? I have every reason to hope that we'll hit 10. <laughs> but will we hit 18? I don't know about that. <laughs> well, we'll, yeah. get to, we'll get to 10 before the depth of the next Martian winter. I think. Um, actually, I'm not so sure about that. That's going to be in the middle of the next Martian winter. Right. That's going to be interesting. So, so winter is going to be a hard one. Next winter, winter is, is going to be hard. Yes, winter, winter is, is coming. coming. Exactly. Brace yourself. <laughs> On the other hand, <laughs> opportunity is now in a much hillier area than it has ever been since it landed. And the thing that you do to survive winter is to tilt your panels toward the north. So um, they should be able to find a better parking spot than they have during past winters. Fantastic. Well. See. well well, thank you very much, Emily. And I know you mm -hmm. might have to run, so if you feel like you want to run and need to run, by all means, we we okay. uh, we totally understand. Uh, well, let's move on then. So, Amy, you uh, you were working on a story about an eighth-century gamma ray burst that uh, they were able to detect the evidence in a tree. Yes, in trees, which I thought was pretty neat and kind of wacky. Um, so apparently, some researchers were studying trees in Japan and noticed. Um, that at some point in the tree's life, uh, judging by the, the tree rings, that there was a sudden rise in the isotope carbon-14. So the, the typical, the, the background of this, I guess, the, the typical carbon that we see or we have in nature is carbon-12. It has six protons and six neutrons. Carbon-14 has eight protons and eight neutrons, and it's, um, it's radioactive. It decays into nitrogen, and it's generally formed. I mean, there is some on the planet, so it does happen naturally. It happens when cosmic rays hit the atmosphere and interact with the nitrogen in the atmosphere. So seeing this spike in carbon-14 at a certain point in the tree's life, they dated it to uh, the year 774 or 775, suggests that there was some really big event that happened that shot a lot of radiation at the Earth that generated all this carbon-14, and now they're trying to figure out what it was. Um, so. So they kind of ruled out some stuff by process of elimination. Um, supernovas probably probably didn't do it because they're super bright when stars explode, and there are no records of astronomers having seen a supernova in seventeen or seven seventy four or seven seventy five. Um, so they they traced it black, back to the birth of black holes. Um, so again, they, they kind of ruled out stars exploding. Oh, sorry, they also ruled out solar flares because a solar flare big enough to actually hit the Earth with enough radiation to to yield the amount of carbon-14 they saw and the spike they saw would be like 20 times the normal solar flare, and someone definitely would have seen that and taken a note, but again, there's no record in astronomy records of, of that event happening. Um, so they've settled on this idea that it could have happened when a black hole was formed from two neutron stars merging into each other, which is kind of fun and kind of wacky. Um, so it would be like a binary system with two stars orbiting each other. If one goes supernova and dies but doesn't have enough mass to actually turn into a black hole, it would just be this dense ball. And if the other one did the same thing and they continued to orbit around each other and eventually their orbits decayed to the point where they would merge, that would be a really, really violent meeting. Um, and one of the byproducts would be a twin beam of energy in the form of gamma rays. And if that happens close or sort of, you know, with the Earth in the right path, then we would get zapped with roughly the amount of energy they think would be needed to account for the amount of carbon-14 they found in these trees in Japan. <laughs> um, right. right now, <laughs> which is um, a lot to figure out from tree rings. Well, we, we've talked about this quite a bit on, on astronomy casts and stuff with these gamma ray bursts, right? There's these two sources of gamma ray bursts, whether they're, they're coming from a really large star that's just detonating as a really mega, you know, supernova, and it's this collapsing into a black hole, or these sort of other situations where you get these neutron stars, various exotic 
objects colliding with each other and, and creating a gamma ray burst. But they're so energetic that you could be in the same galaxy and have your atmosphere, you know, stripped away from halfway across the Milky Way. I mean, it's if you get hit by that beam when those things go off, it's a bad day. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, knowing how much, I mean, I don't, I, I can't believe they can figure this stuff out from tree rings, but. Um, you know, knowing how powerful this energy is, they figured that the event would have had to be somewhere between 3,000 and 12,000 light years away from the sun. Any closer and we wouldn't have an Earth on which to be having this conversation. Oh, yeah, and any yeah. further away, we wouldn't have, there wouldn't be enough radiation hitting the atmosphere to create this carbon-14. So it's sort of like, there's this kind of weird, like, searching for a needle in a universe-sized haystack almost. They're trying to find either... Um, you know, either a 1,200-year-old black hole or a, a neutron star within that 3,000 to 12,000 light year away distance that ha doesn't have the characteristic gas and dust seen after a star goes supernova. So it's kind of this weird, like, looking for something that that's lacking certain things to figure out whether or not this event could have happened within yeah, that's, where they that's, think it is. <laughs> that's well within our galaxy. Yeah. Um, and we and think it. of gamma ray bursts happening way far away. They only happen in the early universe and that's that's yeah. recent and that's close on, on astronomical yeah. scales. Yeah. So well, we... yeah, I mean, if you want some reference material, I highly recommend our good friend Phil Plate's book, yes. Death from the Skies. He has a whole chapter just on what would happen if a gamma ray burst decided to go off uh, in our nearby vicinity. And, you know, nearby used very loosely that, you know, you could be halfway across the galaxy, literally 60,000 light years away, and if one of those goes off and the beams point towards us, then it strips away the, you know, a big portion of our atmosphere and and all the life is uh, you know is sterilized yeah. yeah yeah and and closer <laughs> as you said you know 3,000 light years away it gets worse it gets yeah. you know right. much worse but so, the it's beam a great has reminder. to be it's the I, I beam. It's, it's all about the beam. Yeah, the right? beam has to be pointed at you, and so the chances yes. of that happening are small to begin with, which is yes. saves us. It's not and yet, omnidirectional. All the gamma ray bursts that we're seeing are when beams halfway across the universe are pointed at us. Right. So, you know. I, well, I think this is a great reminder for all of the public as well as science is the fact that there's a lot out there that we need to stay on top of, <laughs> and yeah. so there's there's a lot lots of reason to maintain funding and try to understand the universe a little bit more because there's things that could literally destroy, vaporize us. It's so always interesting, we, yeah, when you discover these existential threats that you didn't realize were out there. You know, like, right. oh, hey, what do you know? There's a way that we could destroy the entire universe. Neat. But could we deal with gamma rays the way we deal with asteroids? Like, are we going to go out and paint a gamma ray so it moves? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no. Yeah, we just no. identify no. them and, I don't know, build bunkers. Uh, um, unless we can get some, some sort of star block, <laughs> like suns, you know. Yeah. If yeah, we have, we have gamma rays. We're just gonna block it yeah. out with my SPF. A giant million. mirror. <laughs> the good, the good news is, is there doesn't appear to be any any potential objects right. within the death zone right. that could be directed at, at Earth. So I'm sure you know, Phil calculates the chances of you actually dying in this way in his book, and it's so yeah. super ridiculously yeah. small. Yeah. I'm right, not losing yeah. sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just eat your vegetables. That's it's the heart disease. That's right. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> so let's move on then, Nicole. You uh, you did this. A beautiful story about the uh, the Manatee Nebula, which I yeah, I talked a little bit about the Manatee Nebula. Um, this is a a let me bring a picture. While and I'm why yapping. have we never had the Manatee Nebula in the uh, virtual star parties? Because it's a radio here. object. Because oh. it was seen. So this is an image. Uh, bring it up right now. Um, this is a region of space that uh, called W50 was imaged by the Very Large Ray, which has been uh, refitted with. Uh, new receivers, um, a new correlator, which is that supercomputer on the back end, uh, all new amazing stuff to make it so much more sensitive than it was before. So it's still the 27 dishes in a Y-shaped array in New Mexico, but way more powerful. And so they made this gorgeous image of uh, of the nebula, and it's actually got this like little corkscrew action going on here. So there's actually a microquasar inside, which is a stellar mass black hole, has material falling onto it, and then the jets of material are being flung out in either direction. So it's kind of like a quasar that you get in the, in the center of a, of a galaxy, but on a much, much smaller scale. It's like a, it's is, like a quasi quasar? It's a quasi quasar, yes! <laughs> so the micro quasar is causing this little corkscrew, this, this sort of corkscrew shape, and um, Heidi Winter was the uh, assistant to the director of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and she is 
just one of my favorite people in the world. Um, she, she's the most enthusiastic people about astronomy and uh, has been a big inspiration to me throughout my graduate career um, in Charlottesville. So she saw this image and was like, that looks like a manatee. <laughs> And then so the so uh, Tanya Burchell, who is the uh, science writer for the National Radio Astronomy, was like, "Oh my gosh, you're right! It looks like a manatee." And she actually used to work with manatees in Florida for man um, and monitoring the, the manatee population. And so they got together and and pushed hard to get this nebula named. Um, and so they went and they did a big announcement at a manatee festival in Florida. And so uh, they're they're raising awareness for the, the troubles that manatees have to go through. They get hit with propellers, um, have you know all kinds of issues there, and raising awareness for a new radio telescope. So it's bringing two types of science together in, in a really cool way. In a really cool way. And a lot of our radio objects have really boring names. So it's nice to get cool names for the radio catalog, so Radio Sky. That's really cool. And a yeah. beautiful picture and a lovely story. So lovely story. Heidi and Tanya and fantastic people. Um so Scott, uh let's say that I I come up with a name for I need a name for some kind of object, but I've used the same word fifty two times. I just keep saying, you know, solar astronomy, solar astronomy, solar astronomy. I need a way to use a different set of words. What can I do? Well, what you can do is wait a little bit. Um, the, the American Institute of Physics and IOP Publishing, um, they, they've announced a, their gift of a new um, astronomy thesaurus called the Unified um, Astronomy Thesaurus, which is going to be astrothesaurus.org. Um, I'll put that up into the comments there. I am but so going to use this. It's going to be amazing. Right I, now, there's four real main resources as far as etymology, as far as words, and how um, they're, they're used in throughout publication and how it's used with outreach. But they're kind of all over the place. And so you have different people using their own specific terminology. So when you're looking at different people doing the same types of research as you, they might not use the same words. So the keyword search that you're looking for isn't going to show anything up. So this is a, a way of getting the industry to more standardize what they're using, but also finding very similar verbiage of what they're trying to do, which I think is a great collaborative um, has a lot of collaborative properties because it's all going to be Creative Commons. So it's going to maintain the the research that those people have done and that those research groups have done. So it's still theirs. However, the entire thing becomes a resource to everyone to be able to use and to expound upon to find a you know a better connection to each one of the researches that, that are happening. Um, I'll also put up in in the comment here the four main. Um, the four main resources that are used right now as far as with um, different astro dictionaries and sorry that are currently used but again they're all over the place and so they're trying to find a way through the American Astronomical Society um, that will make it freely available they're trying to find a way of a centralized resource that everybody can use and help reference one another as far as new um, either new research being done new communication that needs to happen which I think is extremely important I, I, I'm really into the communication portion of it that we need to find a better way to communicate with one another inside the field but also find better ways of collaborating to get our information out to the public to get them excited about it because you know we might not understand that we're working on the same thing because we're using different words mm -hmm. so we can find better ways to work together we can find uh, different resources of, hey, well, this interests this person over here and this interests this person over here, but they're connected by this. And now we can make a, a joint effort on uh, getting the public excited about what's I'm, going on. I'm curious to see the Active Galactic Nuclei session, section because there's like a zoo of names for different types of Active Galactic Nuclei yeah. based on how they right. were discovered that has nothing to do with what's physically going on. See uh, for, no. Um, there's C for hey, one, there's C for two, there's right. Quasar, there's quasi-stellar <laughs> object. <Yeah>. There's <laughs> right. Lac. there's Blazar, yeah. Blazar, right. Don't get me right. started. Yeah. And they're all but, but a lot of it just depends on the orientation of the orientation, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Blazar. Um, yeah, no, but I can even just think like, you know, when we're writing our articles and we're trying to get through 
you know, trying to sort of make sure that we're getting the terminology really correct. I think that'll be really useful. So I'm really looking forward to that. Right. Yeah. There, there's a lot of news up there. It's on, um, again, astrothesaurus.org. They have their goals, some details as far as current resources that are available that you can take a look at. But it, I'm really excited that it's being uh, released under Creative Commons. You know, that, that, I think that's huge as far as keeping everything, you know, tight. Well, let's, let's open this up and let's allow collaboration between everyone to make this a really, really good resource globally. So Nicole, have you got my my Beetlejuice picture? I I'm do. Gonna, I'm going I'm to move on to that okay, and and up. attempt to both be a host and present some news because I've worked on a story this week for once. Um, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, poorly. Beetlejuice. Uh, yeah. Okay. Fraser cool. Kane, so, Fraser Kane. Fraser Kane. <laughs> yeah. You go. Uh, don't say it three times. So this is a picture of the star Beetlejuice, which of course you probably all know is on the shoulder of Orion. Beautiful, bright red, super giant star that is likely to detonate within the next probably million years. Tomorrow, anywhere between tomorrow and a couple of million years from now. And when it does, it will be uh, for sure one of the brightest objects in the sky, visible, you know, daylight. It's going to be outrageous. Come on, explode. But, um, but it's still doing its thing. And so it is, uh, you know, dozens of times the mass of the sun. And it is <clears throat> kind of the outer envelope of this star is bubbling in these convective, uh, almost like you know you put water on a on a pot and you let it boil. You get these bubbles of water, and so what's happening is that you're you're seeing these these asymmetric bubbles of material that are being ejected off of the outer uh, atmosphere of, of Betelgeuse. And then what's happening is these things are, are spreading outward uh, into this bow shock, which now is impacting the, inter, the interstellar um, medium that, that Betelgeuse is moving through at, I don't know, like 30 kilometers a second or something like that. And what's really interesting about this picture as well is how um, it's moving towards this structure. And you can see this over on the left-hand side of the image. There's this, like, wall. And in many cases, when you see that kind of stuff, you know, astronomers usually assume that it's that, that was old material that was ejected from the star a long time ago and now it's, you know, it's you know, in some outburst or whatever. But because of the shape, because it's very wall shaped, it's just something else. You know, some big wall of of, of dust and gas. But the thing is, Be Beetlejuice is illuminating it because you know you can kind of imagine a uh, a car zooming through the fog, and so it's seeing the fog with its with its headlights at night. Um, but but I thought it was just a really, really great, great picture and a really sort of neat piece of piece of research. So apparently, in the next probably five thousand years, that that bow shock is going to hit that dusty veil, and about twelve thousand years after that, the star itself is going to impact it. Although you know that's kind of fancy words. I don't think much is going to happen. You know, it's going to move into that dust, and yeah. So, and now at some point, I would now I would ask myself questions about it, yeah. but I don't need to. So let's move on. You um, everything and, perfectly. And so, <clears throat> um, so Fraser, what do you? you know, uh, okay, so I think the the last story that we had queued up, which is just uh, adorable, um, and adorable. you've got some pictures for this, which is the, the the new research that dung beetles use the Milky Way to navigate. Yeah, which so is awesome. So uh, it, Alan Boyle had to had to had to uh, bump out right before, but he was going to talk about this, so I quickly read up on it right before. <laughs> uh, but I had to show this picture because it's a dung beetle wearing a hat. Wait, hang on. I'm hitting the wrong button. It's a dung beetle wearing a hat. So what these these researchers did in South Africa is they um, had these different... Look, they even have a, like, a little number painted on the beetle yeah. <laughs> to identify. Number eight. Number eight. And Stay yeah, on they, target, number they eight. Had, they had beetles with little clear hats, you know, as their control group, and then with these dark yeah. hats. Um, and they went through several experiments, both out in the South African desert and inside a planetarium where they had a more controlled environment. And they discovered that dung beetles would go round and round in circles with these hats on. Um, and this was regardless of <laughs> of the phase of the moon. So it wasn't just that they, they navigate by the moon, but they also navigate using the brightness of the Milky Way. And of course, if you've ever been in the desert uh, somewhere in the southern hemisphere, you know that it is it is ridiculously dark, and the Milky Way is ridiculously bright and gorgeous. Um, so so in a way, the researchers weren't terribly surprised because oh, there's this bright thing in the sky. It's overwhelmingly bright. Um, but the fact that they were actually able to test this with little dung beetle hats and actually prove that they were using um, the band of the Milky Way to navigate uh, their way out of a maze was pretty impressive. 
I, I think Dung Beetle then now needs to be renamed because Dung Beetle is such a terrible name. It's such a mean name, right? I mean, Who obviously that's funny. <clears throat> that's what funny. they do. I know that's what they do. They push around big balls of dung. But what yes. about you know Sky Gazer Beetles? Hmm. Uh, you know Astronomer Beetles. Astronomer Beetles. I like it. So Astro Poop. Uh, Astro. Astro poop, poop beetles. Astro poop beetles. Astro oh. poop beetles. Okay, I'm. Gonna... All right. Well, we've got uh, we've got some time. We'll take a little take some questions from the yeah. uh, from people watching. So uh, now, if you don't know how, um, you can post a question. You can either do it on the event page if you're watching it there. You can post your question uh, if it's in. I think it's in Nicole's stream is Somewhere. where the actual public. Yeah, and then I reshared it. So you can try posting a question there. Although I don't like your chances of us actually seeing it if that's where you put your question. No, I, um, I included all of them. Well, I know. Hopefully. I just still, I, I, I have a certain amount of uh, <laughs> lack of faith Skepticism. of technology. Right. The safe place is to go to YouTube. And so you just click on the little YouTube. If you're watching this right now, you can click to watch it on YouTube. Don't yes. worry. You'll still be able to see it live over there. But then you'll get all the comments on YouTube, and that way we can make sure. So, yeah. uh, so a few questions. Uh, one, Todd Howard notes, uh, loves the way Nicole's name tag on the hangout matches her hair color. That is on purpose. <laughs> I am purpose. not very creative. <laughs> yes. And okay. I saw a question um, from Greg Layden. Um, yeah. Awesome science blogger Greg Layden. Why yeah. do gamma ray bursts come in beams instead of ever expanding round ball thingies? Which is a great question. Hmm. So a supernova explosion. Um, you have the star. Uh, pretty much exploding off in all directions. But what happens in a hyper... Um, as I understand it, what happens in a massive star explosion with a hypernova, the center is collapsing into a black hole, and so you've got this angular momentum craziness and accretion disk forming. And when you have an accretion disk forming around a, a very massive, dense object like that, you often get jets in either direction. You see this with quasars, you see this with... Uh, not even just with black holes, but with forming stars. Um, and so it shoots out beams in either direction while it's forming a, um, a hypernova. I'm probably completely messing up this explanation, but it's the way that this, the massive, hypermassive star collapses into a black hole that it creates jets of material that go out along the poles of the accretion disk. And so that's why the, the, the gamma ray burst only... Um, you know, points out in these specific beams. The way they figured that out was that they looked at how much energy came out in these gamma ray bursts and realized if that's coming out in every direction, that's that's physically impossible. Um, so that's how they were able to figure that out. Right, but if I understand correctly, it is both. It is both a big explosion ball thingy yes. and the there extra, ball thingy. the extra special deadly yes. beams. Yes, so the you extra get special deadly beam. Yeah, right. is what we see as a gamma ray burst. Right. So you but get that still, one two it punch. It still goes normal supernova in every direction. Yeah. 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 And so if you happen to be a few thousand light years away from a star that went off as a gamma ray burst, right. still a bad day. Yes. But get the beams pointed at you and then it's a sterilizing, you know, end of all life day. And that's, that'd be so, a universal so that... sterilization, not just a <laughs> <laughs> biological, no, you're just gone. Yeah. So that means if we get hit, if, if the Earth is in the path of a, one of those beams that we're seeing it from the top down? Like, one of the, what do you mean by the yeah. poles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, yeah. Is, what so, does it mean? What is top in space? If, if, the, accretion <laughs> yeah. disk, if the accretion disk is like the it's equator, way, then, it's... then like north and south okay. are the poles of the gamma ray. Okay. Yeah. 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 There we go. He's got a there. demo. He's got a CD. <laughs> he highlights got. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Um, now, has anyone heard, so uh, Danny Henke asked, has any, any thoughts on Kepler's possible malfunction? Has anyone been tracking that story? No. Um, I have. It's, it's pretty similar to what um, happened with Dawn, and it, uh, it, it always comes down to reaction wheels, and it, and it strikes me as kind of funny and ironic that of the, all of the different technologies that we send to space, it's the wheel that keeps on messing up. They never um, send enough up. <laughs> But, um, you know, these things are, are, there's actually, spacecraft don't generally have a lot of moving parts. They particularly don't have a lot of moving parts that are always in motion. And that's what a reaction wheel is. It's a spinning wheel that's always spinning. And so what happens is that over time, these things degrade. The lubricant um, either degrades or it wanders to other parts of the machine. And so they, they wind up, they start having a lot more friction than they should. Um, and, so, and basically, they, they wind up not being reliable anymore. Um, reaction wheels are used to point to spacecraft. They do it with weird angular momentum things that, that make my head spin. Um, not to be... To, actually, to be Love funny. it. Right, um, but it's in the wheel, and then the spacecraft turns the other way. Turns the yeah. other way, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, and so they help point... You can spin each wheel and turn yourself accordingly. 
And for Kepler, incredibly precise pointing is the whole name of the game of the mission. So some spacecraft, like Dawn, for instance, can just go to reaction thruster, uh, reaction um, control systems, which are basically thrusters in order to do their pointing. It's not as efficient. The fuel um, gets used up, and so that can shorten the life of the mission. But it still works as well as they need to point in order to accomplish, accomplish their mission. Kepler can't do its mission without reaction wheels. It requires incredibly precise pointing. And so um, it actually, it, like most spacecraft, it launched with four reaction wheels. There's three that are located, that are orthogonal to each other, and then a backup fourth one that's at an angle to all of those so that if any one of the original three fails they can switch to the backup and again it's less efficient but it still works um, so they lost one of them a long time ago and because of Don because they understand what happened with Don they were able to manage the reaction wheels on Kepler for a long time to avoid the problem that they ran into with Don they think so they, they think they actually have a way to heal the problem that the problem reaction wheels have in right now so they went into safe mode for a couple of weeks um, and basically stopped the wheel from spinning. They, they're trying to get the lubricant inside it to sort of move back into all the places it needs to go, and then they're going to try to recondition it and see if they can get it working again. So that's where they're at right now. Let's hope that it works, um, because the longer that Kepler keeps running, the smaller mass planets it can find. Yeah, and I mean, I know they always seem to have these these wonderful, you know, they pull out these kind of uh, MacGyver solutions where they're like, well, we figured out a way to use the... I don't know the exhaust of the you know of this material to use that as one of our you know to replace a gyro and so on and so well, they you know Hubble's actually, always down to like two gyros out of six you know the key to getting um, to getting Kepler's to last longer than Don's did was incredibly simple they just ran the wheel backwards as much as they ran it forwards. It's the same fix that they developed for um, Spirit and Opportunities motors when they started getting a little bit bulky. They started driving the rovers backwards as much as they drove them forwards. And it's it's just, you know, you you run it backwards, the lubricant goes one way, you run it forwards, the lubricant goes the other way. And that managed to keep it alive for a lot longer right. than it might otherwise have. Right. So sometimes you just got to go take the wrong, the long way around to get to your to what you need to point <laughs> right. at. That's fantastic. I, I love yeah, I love the ingenuity though. It's like yeah. you know, we are astrophysicists and huge engineers, but sometimes you just got to run it backwards because it's a simple answer, it's a simple solution. There and I think is, that's a very beautiful way of approaching things like that. And I think there's some best practices that come out of this, as you said, you know, which is like okay, let's bake in it. If we lose a react reaction wheel next time, we know how to to turn, you know, Three three wheels to act like four, and how to make two act like three, and so on. So it's it's great that they that they do that, and I love. I mean, I think those are our favorite stories, are the ones where they've where the engineers, the Apollo thirteen, where the engineers have come down and they figured out this amazing solution for this problem, and they thought all hope was lost, but no, no, they've been able to eke out some more science. I love it. Well, the best um, so the best reaction wheel story by far is Hayabusa, because of course they also launched with four, lost a couple early on, they crashed into the asteroid and almost didn't survive that, lost another one. Yeah. Then on their way home, they lost a third one. So they were right. down to one reaction one. wheel. Um, and they were. They also had four ion engines and had lost two of them completely. The third one they managed to get working by routing the xenon from one past the ionizer of another. But that gave them, so they could, and you need three Right, and that's what I was mentioning, right? Craft. Yeah, you're, you're using things that were never meant to be reaction wheels as reaction wheels. Well, it gets right? better because, so the, in order to have three axis control, you have to have three methods of control. And so they, they had the, the xenon in the engines was one, the one remaining reaction wheel was the other. And you know what the third was? Solar sailing with the solar panels. That's how they got their third axis of that's control. That's brilliant. Yeah, love it. <laughs> so I think, you know, at this point, you really always got to ask, have we got enough reaction wheels? <laughs> Is there any, where, any way we could put more reaction wheels into this? Or we make a space, spacecraft made entirely out of reaction wheels. So, <clears throat> all right, so let's move on. Um, uh, DeVizardo of Oz on YouTube asks, will a Beetlejuice supernova have any impact on Earth? I don't think it's uh, close yeah. enough. No, it's not yeah, so actually I went and ran over to Pamela's bookshelf. This is the book you want to check out from your library or buy in your bookstore if, you ha if you're worried about how supernovae or gamma ray bursts are going to kill us. And I'm really sad that Phil's not here since we keep, we're getting a lot of questions and he probably has this stuff on the top of his head. Uh, yeah. But I think it needs to be within something like 100 light years to, to really yeah, impact very us. Close. And there's no big star that close. Beetlejuice is yeah. not close enough. It'll be freaking gorgeous. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And same die. with uh, V.Y. Canis Majoris, right? Yeah. No. Uh, uh, Eta Carina? Eta Carina, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Eta Carina, which is, which is probably within the next 100,000 years going to detonate, unfortunately only visible in the southern hemisphere. So. 
they get all the predictions. I think if it happens within our lifetime, I will totally go to the Southern I will go. Watch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, That's my uh, Gary Ray R. suggests that Astro Poop Beetle sounds like a good name for a band. So. <laughs> I think that's, you know... I don't have my crocheted gotta, poop with me. you got to hold that do, up and say, it does it make a good band, band name? Yeah. Oh is it a cosmic cover band? Yeah. Jeffrey Hellman asks, uh, when was the last time, if ever, we witnessed a star exploding, which was visible in the daytime sky? 1066? 1054? Is that really the most recent? The didn't, Crab Nebula one? Didn't <clears throat> Chico Brahe see one? And like He did. Well, oh, yeah. It's called but Tycho's Nebula. During, but visible during the daytime? Was, wasn't it visible for like two days? Yeah, he. Not, not, not At a lot one of point actually... in my life, I knew a lot about that event. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> but for sure, the 1054 mm. event that created the Crab Nebula was was visible in the daytime sky. It doesn't happen all, you know, once a millennium. So. Our, our Danish astronomer Jens, uh, 1604 was the latest one he just commented. That was, the, that was the Tycho one then, right? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, visible during the daytime, I think that's I the. Jens, if you can confirm that for us, that would be super. Um, <clears throat> now, Jens Riggleson uh, sort of responds about back on that gamma ray burst story and wonders um, if we're going to see uh, the gamma ray burst hit molecular clouds 600 light years away in the opposite direction, which I think is a really neat sort of way to think about it. Yeah. And then the reflection of those coming back at us to get you a gotta sense. You've got to wait that long, though. You've got to wait 600 years, yeah. Yeah. Eighth century, no, no, wait. Would it have passed? You'd need yeah. to wait twice as long, yeah. right? If if you were yeah. just looking at a straight reflection and back, or no, yeah, to, so to, point, like three times point, as long. And we did, we actually did a, an episode of this in Astronomy Cast called Light Echoes, and this is this is one of these techniques that astronomers use to figure out things that are that are happening. Is you might not see the event itself, but you might see the light you know, moving at light speed, passing through material that's surrounding the event, right. and then the and then that light is then echoing back, and you're able to see that light sort of flashing through material or, or what have you. And so we may very well see, you know, in the opposite direction of where that gamma ray burst was, light reflecting or radiation reflecting back from that. Well, that's so. not necessarily the opposite direction. That's off to the side often with a light echo. It's something yeah. kind of behind it and off to the side. Um, yeah. That reflects or, or, or is, is showing evidence of whatever event happened. Hmm. Uh, yeah. We're getting corrected on the dates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, 1572 was Tycho's. Okay. 1604 was not. There you go. Uh, there we go. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> so there you go. 400 years. 400 ish years, we get a, a one that's visible in the daytime. Or at least was visible. The naked eye. Yes. Um, I don't know if we still have Emily here. Okay, so Riding with Robots asks, uh, by the way, Riding with Robots, great blog. Check it out. Um, other than pure awesomeness, what will be the significance of a fluorescing Martian rock? Does it constrain mineral identification? Yes, it does. Um, like color, it's not unique, so you can't just say, oh, it's orange, it must be selenite. It, it doesn't quite work that way, but um, it does reduce the number of possibilities of the mineral that can be there. And actually, speaking of writing with robots, this is not related to curiosity, but Bill is going to start doing a weekly post of a pretty picture on planetary.org starting on Monday. So that's going to be exciting. Um, I've, been, so. I've been following his blog for years, so that's, that's fantastic. Super. Um, okay, so so it it is other than awesomeness. It is um, it gives you some idea of the mineral, but it doesn't necessarily give you a perfect signature of it. No, but it like like you said, it constrains the the um, the possible um, kind. So if you would have figured out from color, what is another thing? Um, if it has crystal faces that you can see, if it has a crystal shape, that helps. Um, so all of these things are just different bits of evidence you can use to figure out what mineral it is. Awesome. Okay, well, why don't we, uh, I think we've got a, a bunch of the questions. Why don't we uh, wrap things up now? So uh, we're going to move through again our, our team of people just to make sure that everyone knows where they can find out more of their awesomeness. So Amy, where can we find out more Amy? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is down there in Google+. Plus. Um, and amyshiratitle.com. My blog Vintage Space is there, and you can get links to a lot of my other stuff. You should put the website in your... I should, shouldn't I? Yeah. But you just do a search for Vintage Space and you'll get it. Or, yeah, or, you'll I mean, get it. It's all there. All right, and of course, Emily Lechtawala, Planetary Society blog, blogger extreme. 
Extra. You've actually got a lot of help now, though. I mean, you're not just the only person doing the, uh, the Planetary Society yeah. blog anymore. No, I'm actually spending more of my time editing guest blog posts now than I am in writing my own posts. We've got Welcome a lot of great people. Welcome to my on. world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so planetary.org and planetary.org slash blogs. And Nicole, uh, now that you're a blogger I am. with your Manatee Nebula, right? I, I've been blogging for a while. Oh, I know, but we but that was over on Discovery, right? Yeah, that one's on yeah. Discovery. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I am at noisyastronomer.com, and you can find links to all my other blogging on Discovery and Skeptic and CosmoQuest and everywhere else. Uh, and go to cosmoquest.org. Do science. Do science. <laughs> and Scott, where do we find more Scott? I am a bald astronomer on Twitter. I'm much more active on Google Plus than I am anywhere else as far as social media goes. I guest blog at CosmoQuest. I have my website, knowthecosmos.com, which is currently broken, but I'm in the process of fixing it. <laughs> but uh, oh. it's very broken. It makes me sad. We've been sad. watching this yeah. happen over the last few nights. It is sad. I've, but, I've uh, been through many of those. Um... Where can we find you, Fraser? Oh, yeah, no, we'll, yeah, we'll, Fraser, we'll get that in a second, but no, I wanted to mention, uh, sorry, I wanted to oh. mention that, that Scott and me and Scott for sure, and then other people, will be uh, doing the virtual star party on Sunday night. So, yes, we will. Uh, that'll be upcoming Sunday night. Uh, start around, we're probably going to start a little later because the Earth is tilting, so <laughs> we're probably going to start, what, 637 this week, right. so. And oh yeah, you can find me at uh, universetoday.com over at Google+, uh, universetoday on Twitter, the space community, I'm kind of everywhere. So, um, No space and, community, we're huge. I know, Have the biggest. Have we broke 100,000 yet? I don't think so, almost. Check. But the space community is the largest community on Google+. Plus. And 96,000. Right there you go. Awesome. All right, well, thank you, everybody, and thanks to everyone watching. Uh, we will see you all uh, next week. Bye, everyone. Wave, 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 wave. <laughs> You're the person who gets to stop the broadcast. Bye! <laughs>